So um, welcome everyone and welcome to the Chorus Forum on linking from data sets to content. We had over a hundred people register for today's event from all around the globe. Today's event wouldn't be possible without the general sponsorship coming from ACS, AIP Publishing, Geoscience World, Silverchair, and STM. Today's forum will run until 12 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time and will also be recorded for later viewing. As our speakers present today, feel free to use Zoom's QA feature found at the bottom of the Zoom window to ask your questions. They will either be answered by the speakers live or in the QA window. Also, feel free to upvote questions that you think are important so we're sure to get to them. So a little bit about Chorus. We're a community effort dedicated to making open research work. Our goals are to help our main stakeholders of publishers, institutions, and funders scale their OA compliance. We work to develop metrics about open data, improve the overall quality of their metadata related to open research, and host forums and workshops like today's forum to connect the stakeholders so they can learn and hopefully build trust with each other. I'm also proud to say that Chorus is an endorser of the STM DataCite Crossref Joint Statement on Research Data. By signing up, we have made a pledge to embrace the best practices and promote their value to our stakeholder community. So with that, I'll turn it over to Shelley to get the show on the road. Thank you so much, Howard. Uh, I'm really delighted to have our speakers here today. So my name is Shelley Stahl. I'm the Vice President of Open Science Leadership at the American Geophysical Union. Uh, this topic today is, is near and dear to my heart making sure that the data that supports our research, the data that supports the broad research initiatives is open and available and linked really well. So it's findable and discoverable um, and potentially even reusable. And the, the different uh, viewpoints we have for our speakers today are going to be very exciting. Uh, so we have Danny Kincaid from uh, the Biological Chemical uh, Oceanographic Data Management Office out of Woods Hole. Uh, Martin Halbert from the National Science Foundation. He is the science advisor for public access. Uh, and Matt Buys, who is the executive director for Data Site. Um, and uh, folks that don't realize how important Data Site is when the, in the linking, um, that is the preferred DOI registry for uh, data sets. And um, so before we head over to our speakers, let's talk about the poll results. We sent out a poll to uh, our, our, our folks. Um, go ahead to the next slide. So the biggest challenges around linking uh, data sets to content. Uh, there was an, a number of uh, elements that were, were brought up. Um, I, I see in the bottom right the importance that it's uh, uh, making sure that it's simple to do. Uh, uh, to, uh, heading over to the left, we're talking, we have a, a, one of our respondents talks about using DOIs to make sure um, that those links are in place. And I'm sure Matt will mention more about that when he speaks. Uh, we have reticence. There are folks that understand the behind the scenes uh, elements about relationship types um, and the timing of things around embargo data. Uh, next slide, please. Metadata is of course important. That's mentioned here a couple times. Uh, the cost and effort and logistics also important. Uh, I think you're getting the gist of not only the technical challenges, but also also the social and cultural challenges around what it takes to actually ensure that linkage happens. And I think the 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 respondent on making it as easy as possible is really quite key in uh, uptake and adoption. Uh, please go on to the next slide. I think we have a couple more. Again, metadata. Again, the relationships. So we have a we have a good solid understanding of what's happening behind the scenes. Okay, next slide. Let's let's. Uh, uh, oh, fun word cloud. Uh, largest on discoverability, largest on reproducibility. I love that because that hits on um, some of the really important criteria around what the purpose of having linkages between data, si data sets and content. Um, it is in fact the uh, discovery and reproducibility as well as the other elements that are in here. All right, so Danny, uh, I would welcome you to uh, get yourself unmuted and sharing. Uh, would you please go ahead and, and hit, kick us off with the first talk? 
Sure. Thanks so much, Shelley. And thank you to Howard and Chorus for inviting me here. Um, as Shelley indicated, my name's Danny. I run a large oceanographic repository that's funded by the NSF. And today I'd like to talk to you about linking information to data from the perspective of a repository, specifically that of an oceanographic one. Um, next slide, please. And so I want to start by telling you a little bit about the fate of data and information as it um, comes out of oceanographic research, and then a little bit about the challenges that are associated with that with, with that landscape of where that data goes from the researcher perspective, a little bit of strategy about how repositories fill this really critical role in linking pieces of information together, and then share an example and hopefully a couple examples if there's time. Next, please. So oceanographic research, hypothesis driven, um, very complex questions that yield highly heterogeneous data types. Um, they're very complex. They vary in type and scale and format. Um, it may be the result of collaborative efforts, several researchers um, generating lots of different data types or it, one individual. Next slide, please. Um, this landscape is very, very, the data landscape is very complex. And there's both good facets of this and not so good facets of this. Um, for example, researchers are sharing more and maybe for now we can overlook that it's probably stick based from funders or journal requirements, but they're sharing more. And um, disciplinary repositories exist to help those researchers share. And there are technologies and strategies at their disposal, those repositories, to help link data and content in a very structured way, the machine readable way. The not so good news about this landscape is that researchers still are challenged to do their own data management and seek out the repositories they need. Oftentimes in oceanography, that means multiple repositories that one individual has to deal with. And so you can imagine the requirements and the formats of all these repositories together is a huge burden. Um, that information gets distributed after the research project. So they have to deal with multiple different locations, distributed content, and um, discovery for an oceanographer coming back to reuse those data has the challenge of figuring out the corpus of a project holistically. It's very challenging. They may not even know what data are distributed. Next slide. And so here's, if you follow me along, I'll give you an example of how this all works. So imagine a research cruise. Um, next slide, please. And they may collect uh, oceanographic samples in the water column. You can hit the next three, Howard, thanks. Um, they may collect organismal samples and create genomic sequences. They may, um, the, the ship as it steams through the ocean is collecting its own data. And finally, they may collect physical samples and do analyses on those samples. And so all of these disparate data types end up in different repositories and you can click through the next four too. And so they all end up in different different locations. Water column comes to my repository. Genetic sequences go to a repository um, run by the National Institute of Health. There's a separate repository for the, the underway ship-based data. And finally, another data repository specifically for geochemistry. So I hope you can get the sense that um, these, these locations, these infrastructures, they don't talk to each other. So suddenly our single research idea is split up. And this is in all of it. If you can hit the next three, there's ORC ID um, information sitting about the researchers involved. And the National Science Foundation has information about its um, the research project funding itself. And then lastly, and most importantly, the, um, the culmination of all of the, the research is published in a paper that sits at the journal. So you kind of get the sense that um, it's really, it's really challenging. None of these repositories speak to each other. And um, it's, it's difficult for the researcher to send that data out, but also a new person to come in and figure this out. So how can repositories help? Click next slide, please. So repositories are poised to leverage things like um, these best practices for how we manage data internally and also expose it. So if you're of the technically inclined set, you can think linked open data allows us to organize data and information in a way that codifies the relationships. And by using best practices like schema.org, we can also expose that 
it so that other people can find our content and pull it and to relate it to data sets as well. But internally, we take structured information on the web and pull it into BicoDemo, for example, persistent identifiers, which is what I'll talk about next. Um, and we all know these are these are strings of characters and numbers that are persistent and governed, and um, they look like data set DOIs and publication DOIs, and even things called accession numbers for sequences, which I'll get into in a little bit. But these are structured pieces of information that repositories can leverage to begin to pull disparate information back into our own metadata. So if you hit the next four slides. So using the power of PIDs, we can begin to let our researcher, you can hit that last one too, let our researcher begin to discover content that sits in other places like genetic resources in NIH and the chemistry in a different repository. We will we'll leverage the data set DOI. We'll leverage the publication DOI and insert it into our metadata. So we start to piece together that, um, that holistic picture of research again. And next slide, please. Here, I'll walk you through an example that, that we use um, or that we conduct with uh, the biogeochemistry uh, community. And here we have, um, we have a biogeochemist who goes out and studies the organisms in the water and looks both at how the water is impacting the organisms and how the organisms in turn uh, impact the water column. And so they will take water chemistry, that data comes to BicoDemo, but they will also take genetic sequences and that data goes to NCBI, um, the NIH repository, where it receives a persistent identifier, a PID. That PID is called an accession number. So these repositories don't talk to each other. They don't know about each other. And the NCBI repository doesn't even have a means of associating additional information to that sequence for any, you know, any other information. Doesn't know about BicoDemo, can't insert any information about BicoDemo. But we can. So next slide, please. What we will do, one more is um, ask that oceanographic researcher, hey, we see that you collected genetic samples. Can you, can you give us your sequence accession numbers, those sequence persistent identifiers? And we will create a data set at my repository of those accession numbers, those persistent identifiers. And we will insert that data in with the rest of the content from that, from that cruise or from that research project. So suddenly now, next two slides, those data are discoverable on the data set page, one more. You'll see if you go to the data at BicoDemo, you'll see this new data set that we've created that allows the researcher to discover the content that's sitting in the NIH repository. Um, one more. And they can take those accession numbers, those persistent IDs, and not only discover that content, but easily access that content that gets right down to the sequences. So even though we have no idea and NCBI has no idea of each other, we've pulled that content together for the researcher. So this kind of gives you an idea of um, how repositories can, can make distributed content more discoverable to the relationship or in the relationship of the data they curate. And we do this for a lot of content. We do this for the journal publication DOI, um, and we explicitly code whether it's a methods paper that's related to the data set or a, a results paper that's related to the data set. And we do this for principal investigator information by pulling in their ORCID so people can go discover other content that that researcher has, has created through their careers. Um, and so that's just that's just one facet of, of how we can help. And you can hit the last slide. But I think there's more that we can do with this concept of linking data sets to, to content. Um, and one of those, Shelley began to kind of allude to the survey results, is that it's hard. It's very hard to get the data sets connected to the peer review publication. And one of the things that we are doing as a repository is working with an emerging group at the Research Data Alliance um, that's called the Repo to Pub Working Group that's aimed at streamlining the process of data publication related to a scholarly publication, because right now that's still really challenging. And so this, this idea is more cultural as it is technical, and, um, and we're just getting off the ground. So if this concept interests you, I, you, please go to that QR code there and you can read more about that, that working group. And lastly, I will say that, you know, 
we can go further with PIDs too, in the sense of not just using them to discover information, but for repositories to pull that content in and help ease the burden of researchers, for example, in providing all their, in, their background information when they come to share their data. We can start doing a little bit more. So I think we have the blueprints of how to get to easing that burden of data sharing, and we have the technologies and we're on our way there. Um, but there's still, you know, there's there's still a long, a long way to go. So that's what I have. Um, I really appreciate again, thank you so much for the opportunity to share. Danny, thank you so much. If anybody has immediate questions for Danny, please pop them in the QA um, so that she can get a chance to try to consider what those answers are or maybe even answer them online. Um, I am I'm so excited, uh, excited and appreciative of uh, the depiction of complexity uh, around what's happening in the researchers world and choosing many different having to choose many different locations for their data. And then what do they do? Um, so thank you for that perspective. Uh, Dr. Halbert, you are up next. Um, hi, please go right ahead. I can unmute myself. Um, thank you, Shelley. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you to Howard and Tara for inviting me to this forum. Uh, I want to try and give you some perspectives from the National Science Foundation on this important topic. Next slide. Um, in this very brief overview, uh, I want to talk a little bit about our public access initiative at the foundation some of the complexities that we're looking at in terms of linking content with data, the context of a particular presidential memorandum that we're implementing right now, and then my main comments about researcher burden, uh, possible applications of AI to this area, and then finally, the fact that it's an international issue of alignment. Next slide. So the National Science Foundation Public Access Initiative is um, our term for all of the activities that we undertake at the foundation to ensure that public, publicly funded research outputs are made publicly accessible. So my role, I'm the science advisor for public access at the agency, and I try to coordinate all of this with the different areas of the foundation and our policy and procedures implementations of these uh, requirements. So we're now working on something that you may have heard of, the uh, White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, so-called Nelson Memorandum, because it was issued under Dr. Alondra Nelson, uh, and its implementation in our uh, public access repository and our annual project reporting processes. Next slide. So, Obviously, you know, from Danny's presentation and others that you'll you'll get here in the moment from Matt, um, there's an enormous power in linking content with data. And there is an enormous uh, opportunity here to express and capture the many potential relationships between various kinds of content and data. There are some 36 distinct relationship types in the data site metadata schema 4.5 version that I hope Matt will talk a little bit about. Um, very, very powerful capabilities for you know, expressing various kinds of relationships between content, ver forms of data, versions of data, all of these things. All of these are, while they're powerful tools for scientific understanding, such complex interlinkages represent a number of practical challenges in terms of implementing them in, in agency policies and procedures. Next slide, please. So I, I mentioned this before, this memorandum that uh, was issued by the White House in 2022 uh, under then acting director of OSTP, Dr. Alondra Nelson, has a, it's quite a dense memorandum, uh, but I think a very good one, and it will be very catalytic and uh, profound in its um, impact and its beneficial impacts on the scientific uh, landscape. I'll draw your attention to two sections of the memorandum, section three, 
which has requirements for us to, as federal agencies, to implement its requirements by 2025. And then section four, which is asking us to complete policy decisions by 2026 with implementation in 2027. The memorandum also encourages agencies to consider a number of additional measures that I'll try to allude to here. Next slide. So I wanna zero in on section four of the memorandum because I think it's the most provocative and while section three got most of the attention because of you know, comments about zero embargo and data and whatnot. I think section four is the more provocative and technically more difficult one to implement, uh, but the one that's going to produce a, a great deal of beneficial impacts long-term. It has three sections, three main sections for A, B, and C that have to do with, in the first case, requirements for quality control in eight key four metadata elements assigned to the two types of research products that the memorandum is focused on, peer-reviewed articles and the data underlying those articles. Section 4B instructs agencies to um, instruct our researchers to obtain a, an ORC ID, uh, key to you know, disambiguating researchers in this um, bibliometric landscape. And Section 4C directs agencies to assign persistent identifiers, AKA DOIs to awards, enabling the awards to be referenced in machine readable citations. So considered as a whole, I think the purposes of section four effectively lead to the concept of an end-to-end -end machine readable knowledge graph for all of the scientific articles and data arising from federal research funding awards. And that's a very profound uh, concept uh, it, when it is, by the time it is implemented, it will lead to enormous advances in terms of uh, uh, the additional capabilities for fair data principles for federally funded research and a lot of additional discoverability options. Next slide. Okay, so the downside of this is obviously that recording all this metadata and ensuring that it's accurate takes work and work is not free and entails labor and cost. And the question that we grapple with and we're asked a lot is who's gonna do all this? Are we gonna require this of our uh, principal investigators, our awardees? Um, is it worth, is, are the beneficial impacts worth all this extra labor? Uh, and who is the most appropriate type of researcher to create and manage all this metadata? Is it the principal investigators? Is it lower level uh, folks involved in research, first year grad students, is it data scientists, is it repository managers? And what kinds of training and preparation is required for these tasks? We spend a lot of time at NSF thinking about what uh, funding programs we can come up with that will advance the state of the art in these areas. and all of these issues are very much on our minds because we're very mindful of um, adding researcher burden uh, in terms of annual project reporting requirements. So we're trying to um, think about implementing the Nelson Memorandum requirements in ways that are fair and effective. Next slide, please. So an obvious idea that um, comes up a lot recently um, because of the enormous focus, especially this year on new AI technologies, is the idea, well, can we use new AI tools to create, surface, uh, identify these various kinds of interlinkages and data and content in automated ways? Possibly. Um, what though are the ramifications of that kind of approach? Uh, AI so-called hallucinations or incorrect assertions are a very real phenomenon. Uh, what, what effect does that have? You know, do we want to inject such errors into the knowledge graph citation networks that we're creating? Can we tolerate that inaccuracy? What um, negative effects could that have on the overall system of scientific information dissemination? If we don't use AI tools, who's going to encode all of these interrelationships? And can we afford all that labor and effort and cost? 
Uh, these are some of the uh, considerations that we're thinking about within the agency. Uh, it's a provocative moment. Uh, one of the main things I want to uh, leave you with are some points about how the next uh, steps in this emerging landscape of interlinkage of data and content are really critical. And I hope we can engage everybody in this discussion. So for my last slide, go, go ahead and advance it. Um, I want to point out that this is not simply a, a matter of alignment at the national scale here in the United States, but also very much at the international level. Uh, this will require a whole range of, of challenges to be addressed and opportunities to be embraced. Um, we can, in this situation, align standards and cultivate a emerging consensus of practice in the world scientific community, although that is obviously no trivial task. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion recently and a proposed uh, national PID strategy for the United States, as well as a number of European countries that could be very synergistic to these goals. And finally, the citation expectations that we're gonna put in place will be key to realizing both the benefits of these new technologies, uh, as well as making reasonable demands on awardees. So these are some of the things that we're thinking about in the National Science Foundation. Thank you very much. I'll be happy when we get through Matt's uh, comments to answer questions. Great. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead, Matt. Thank you, Martin. Carry on, Matt. <laughs> Obviously, way too eager. <laughs> um, it's really, I, I, I think, great to follow on from um, Danny and Martin to kind of um, bring in some some perspective from from both data side and make data count, and so we can jump right into the next slide. Um, one of the key things that um, I like to talk about, and, and this is something for those of you that know data site, this is our vision, connecting research, advancing knowledge. And so we know as a community that by making more research outputs and resources openly discoverable, reusable, and um, available to the broader community at large, that we will advanced knowledge through bringing rigor to the scholarly record and, and open dissemination. And so I like to frame it as the connecting and advancing is the how we do this. And, and the what we are doing is, is research and knowledge. Um, next slide, please. And so specifically getting into this topic, um, and, and um, you've heard some of this um, from, from Martin's talk in that there's been great progress in data sharing. And Danny also touched on this, that th there's been national um, and, and various funder policies that support data sharing. And this has really um, got us to a pivotal moment as the global community in raising awareness amongst communities and really pushed for adoption. Um, we've also seen um, really big advancements in the infrastructure that's available to support this preservation and publication as well as curation and, and controlled access to to meet the range of needs across different communities and so there's been some great progress next slide please but and there's always a but um uh, broad discoverability is not yet the norm for open data and so um, I, I think from a personal point of view that this isn't necessarily a complete picture of, of the situation. There, there are some caveats here in, in that there is information there and, and we're just not tracking it effectively. Um, but I, I do recognize that this is not necessarily the norm. Um, and we still have research assessment frameworks while there has been significant progress and evolution um, research assessment frameworks focus heavily on publications and very few include data. And so we really need to use those lighthouses, those um, exemplars that are really shaping and changing um, research assessment frameworks to help us bring the community along with this. And so um, what I like to think about is in the next slide, please is that we as a community need to cultivate change. And so this is an adoption from um, 
a post that uh, Brian Nozick at uh, Center for Open Science did years ago. Um, and so instead of looking at this as a pyramid, I look at it as an hourglass. And, and so we have policies and we see uh, really great policies coming out in, in the recent uh, year or even couple of years to make things required. And that's really fantastic. I think that's really helping us move collectively across the community. At the same time, at the bottom, we have in infrastructure that's really made significant advancements in connecting, making sure that we can track these things, store things, curate, address the different needs. Um, but the challenge is that it's not easy. And on the top end, it's not necessarily yet rewarding. And that was touching into the uh, piece that I, I was talking about is, is the research evaluation frameworks. And so I see those as critical, two critical pieces that we are about to get into is that how do we make it really truly rewarding for a research to share data and openly cite it and make sure that it's reusable. Um, and we're starting to see that in, in different exemplars, but again, it's not the norm. And then on the infrastructure piece, how do we make it easy? Um, and I'd, I'll talk about a few things there, but making sure that um, there's easy, that it's easy for individuals, for groups, for institutions, for stakeholders to, to track and, and understand the reuse um, of data. Next slide, please. We do have researcher perceptions, and this is really integral to the work that we do, is that we can't evolve policy, we can't improve infrastructure without really understanding researcher perspective. And so um, Danny also touched on this, that, that researchers still perceive data sharing as a burden. And, and this is because of the lack of incentive. And so they are doing this more absolutely. And, and this is great. Um, but it's, why would I spend time on it if there is no incentive and it doesn't amount to anything? And any policy that we have, it's very difficult to really enforce that if we're not following through with incentive. And so um, this is really important. Next slide, please. What is great is that we are seeing this evolution, both on policy and infrastructure. Um, and we are seeing that um, this is value, starting to be valued by researchers that, okay, data citation linking research data sets to another object within the research lifecycle. So it could be a paper, preprint, a report, um, another data set. And that this is starting to be valued by researchers um, there are existing workflows available, and we've heard about this already and in the prior talks that repositories, publishers um, are, are geared towards supporting this within workflows. And there's also really interesting tools in the community that have been developed to identify data citations. And, and I'll talk in a moment a bit about a collective community effort and how do we truly democratize that metadata? Um, th there was notions of that this is time consuming to, to generate or maintain this metadata. And so how do we collectively as a community tackle this? Next slide, please. One really important initiative um, that is really doing a lot of work in this space is Make Data Count. Um, I serve on the advisory group and Make, Make Data Count or Data Site is the fiscal sponsor um, currently for, for Make Data Count or Fiscal Home, I should say. Um, and really what Make Data Count is working to do is one, build open infrastructure and the community-based standards around this. Um, two, advocate through outreach and adoption around uh, research assessments, um, frameworks, policy evolution, and then working collectively as a community to contextualize this um, as, as a community to create these incentives. Next slide, please. And so one big important effort that Make Data Count has developed just recently is the data citation corpus. And this brings together data citation information, um, initially starting with data sets that have accession IDs and DOIs, 
um, bringing together the citation information that's openly available in the community, both from metadata sources, but as well as third party sources. So uh, one of the key sources in the initial launch of the file um, was the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative Open Science Team uh, developed an AI algorithm that went and pulled out uh, citation metadata, and that was one of the sources that came into the corpus. And we're already on version 1.1 and moving to 1.2 and 2.0 later this year. So lots of exciting things happening there. But this data citation corpus serves to um, address needs of researchers, so insights into their data impact, so that that's kind of addressing that burden that researchers see providing the ability for institutions to evaluate data usage trends, reach of faculty outputs, funders to evaluate the reach of their research data that they've funded or research that they funded that has produced data and the entirety of their research ecosystem to really do more large scale analysis into trends and practices so that we can evolve these frameworks. Next slide, please. And um, finally, I just wanted to um, um, touch on a, a few kind of immediate priorities that, that I would call out. One, we have to stop focusing on altering publisher behavior. Um, this isn't a, a dig at publishers necessarily, but publishers have many different systems and workflows in place. And so we can't hope for um, a citation piece of metadata to perfectly get through this entire chain of systems and end up in Crossref that then needs to end up somewhere else and all of these things need to work perfectly for this to happen. We, we can't wait for that. So we need to stop focusing on that. And we need to focus on how do we collectively as a community, um, I'm starting to talk a lot about how do we democratize metadata as a community? How do we track the provenance of where those metadata connections or metadata updates are happening? Give the ability to the community to um, basically have a view both through programmatic API calls, strip away community um, uh, community metadata, and just have the metadata of the entity that registered that metadata, and also be able to do that in interfaces. So really exciting work happening there. Um, repositories can and should add citation links uh, to data set metadata, and this is happening um, to the scale of millions. Um, our event data service, I think, currently has about 420 million um, links in it. A lot of that is related to data sets, um, so that's really fantastic. Uh, we also have lots of text mining and NLP um, technologies that are available. We must definitely use these to expedite, expedite the surfacing of these data citations and pull them into open aggregate trusted sources um, and leverage open metadata that's available, the persistent identifiers and aggregate linkages um, that, that are not exposed in, in open sources. So how do we go find those, those edge sources in the community? Um, final thing that I'll say is a lot of people say, well, how do we address duplication in, in some of these efforts? Um, when we talk about democratizing metadata, the same fact or the same claim about metadata from multiple sources builds trust in that metadata provenance. And so we can track multiple sources saying the same thing. So as a citation, this data set, if, if the repository says this data set is cited by this paper, the publisher says it, and a, a text mining algorithm says the same thing. We know that it's true and correct. And so building that trust and building that multiple sources is a key piece of this. Uh, next slide, please. And just a final shout out. Um, we do have, as Make Data Count, a, a summit in London um, later this year. And um, it's a great event that brings together key policy stakeholders as well as practitioners, infrastructure folks, uh, bibliometricians, um, researchers into the same room to talk about making data count. And so it's a great, great um, event to, to build on um, a lot of this work that's being discussed today. And that's it for me. Thank you, Matt. I really appreciate that. I just wrote that date down. Um, so one of the things that is coming to mind as a, a first question. And for everybody who's listening, please go ahead and pop your questions into the Q&A section. I'll, I'll get us started. I, I've got one that is, I, I don't think the word provocative, but it's kind of in, uh, it's kind of deep into the problem. Um, I was having a conversation 
around what exactly is being cited within the publication. And I, you know, from my own, uh, AG has their own journals, and I know what our editors are saying to our authors, it's the data that supports the findings in the paper. That's clearly the minimal, absolute minimal. And it's it's not even good enough, but um, the habit of, of citing data, of preserving data is still uh, being built as we're all as we're all attesting to. And and the the data is that's being shared is not actually the, uh, doesn't have the provenance back to the actual uh, observations. Um, so I'm coming out of the earth and space science. So, you know, it could be, um, you know, some calculation around that data, but not the actual data itself. So not the, there's no link to the original data set. And I'm wondering when it comes to linking and Matt, you leaned in on provenance. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if you could all maybe speak about, you know, the value of having um, those connections, those understandings um, for reuse. Um, who'd like to start? D Danny, why don't we why don't we come back to you? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I would love to dig into this. So, um, one of the one of the intensive of um, repository like Bicodema that is disciplinary, um, often researchers come to deposit their data, and it ends up being that derived data, a very consolidated summary of that data. And one of the challenges we see in that is the timeline, which alludes back or ties back to this working group that's going on in the chat right now, um, that researchers collect their data, develop their, um, you know, their conclusions and go to write it. And once they get to the journal, suddenly they have to share that data and it's challenging for them, A, be they're thinking only in the limited scope of that publication and see those data might be might be just derived summaries. And so we stop and pause and say, well, for for transparency, for for open science, you need the corpus of data behind those statistical summaries. And um, the problem that we face is that that takes time to to curate that content. So once they've gotten to publication and we stop them and say, whoa, 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 how about everything that generated these statistical data sets? Um, a lot of friction happens there, uh, but we do ask for it because it is important. Um, we also collect the provenance and present that in the data set metadata um, of, of the linkages between the original observations and the statistical summaries that are presented in the publication. So it's really hugely important. It's also very challenging. Thank you. I think it's really important to bring this out. M Martin, do you want to jump in on the conversation? Sure. Um, all, all great comments, Danny. Um, this is a hugely important topic and one that we are having a lot of discussions about within NSF. Um, what What is reasonable, what's effective, what's manageable? I mean, so w one of the most recurring sets of comments are you probably don't want to, well, in an ideal world, we have everything linked beautifully, you know, beautifully documented and so forth. But as Danny said, that all of that takes a hell of a lot of work. Um, so what is the minimum viable product, I guess, is, you know, part of what we think about. Um, you don't want to link to simply the raw, unprocessed data be solely because it's unprocessed. And, you know, the point, much of the point of all this is scientific integrity in terms of, of making research results reproducible. So you want to link to process data, the process data, at least to the point that uh, the experiment or finding can be reproduced um, with sufficient documentation in terms of code books, uh, data dictionaries, and so forth to make the data intelligible for purposes of scientific experimentation. Uh, together with also, oh, by the way, you know, any software that you develop to run the experiment or, you know, any, any of the other appurtenances or things that are required to uh, reproduce the, the result. Um, trying to figure out how to express all that concisely in terms that individual disciplines 
you know, that makes sense in ind individual disciplinary contexts is a very challenging task and something that we're engaging all the different directorates of NSF in trying to think through. Mm -hmm. So hugely important, but also one, you know, I'll, I'll say, as always, NSF, uh, we try to operate as a bottom-up organization driven by the scientific communities that we serve. NSF is hopefully well known as an agency that is closely, tightly linked to the communities that we fund. And so we very much would like to see thoughts from the communities uh, that we serve about these matters. Thank you. You know, Shelley, if I can follow on really quickly, I think Martin hit a really good point in, um, in so many of the geosciences, what's considered the raw versus research ready is really challenging and it's gray and sort of sliding and squishy. And so, you know, I, I would let, I would just make a point of clarification that that is um, really what we're after is that research ready original data versus the, you know, and, and oftentimes it is, it is highly variable. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a challenge for sure. Matt, please go ahead. Great. Um, yeah, I think really nice to kind of follow on for that. You know, the 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 objective here, and, and I'm speaking really from an infrastructure point of view, um, and so great to have the two perspectives prior to mine, is that we want to bring rigor to the scholarly record, and that's kind of the driver here. Um, we can, from an open scholarly infrastructure point of view, with things like the PID graph, realize two hops. So we can go from paper to structured published data to then unstructured and we can nest those unstructured in that what the challenge is is that and i think this has been touched on is that that's difficult takes time and effort and so i come back to kind of we need to make sure if we're asking or we want that to happen that there's in, one it needs to be incentivized and rewarding to do it but two it needs to be easier to do that and so i think there's a bit of work across kind of um the the broader kind of ecosystem to to make sure that it's a little bit easier um, but also that we're rewarding and then um you know i think it's really great like hearing danny and martin's perspectives because these are like the folks that are really making us or helping us move forwards because making it easier you know with Pico demo making you know the policies from nsf's point of view like really support and incentivize us this is what's going to drive change and so, um, yeah, kind of the, the pieces are coming together in, in my mind. And, and so we, we at this really exciting point. It's not all perfect. I think we need to also recognize that as a community. Um, you, you know, uh, perfect is the enemy of good. We do need to kind of move forwards together and, and be okay with a bit of this. We won't have it all worked out. Um, but I'm also a big fan of moving forwards rather than sitting around in the room and, um, saying the same thing in five years time um, to each other. So let's move forwards and, and learn as we go. Here, okay. here to all those yeah. points, Matt, can I make one additional comment, uh, Shelley, that, um, you know, we, we increasingly, most permutations of these conversations I, I listen to have some iterative model of metadata enhancement, whether human mediated or machine mediated in mind. What process do we want to put in place for validating or certifying that those those interconnections are accurate? You know, because without some sort of a validity check or or validation, somebody claiming that yeah, this is an accurate and true connection, the record again is is still suspect. So you know, thinking about these these interconnections and processes is going to be very important in this space. Yeah, I appreciate you saying that, Martin. I I I have my own set of talks on responsible AI and there's there's the, there's a lot of um concern still, um but there's a lot of opportunity as well. Um so so in this same discussion, um I would interject a conversation that I had this week. Um I was at a hydrology conference water Psycon. it's one that my organization um helps hosts with others and I was talking to the president of AGU's hydrology section and he, he this this is a topic these things that we're discussing are things that I work on every day and this very topic came up and his take on it and I I've been we had some follow-up conversations was he doesn't feel that 
a researcher understands the level of effort that needs to go in for, um, and, and let's say we're, we're targeting data that is most likely to be reused. Right, so we so there's lots of argument on which data gets the most curation. Let's just in our minds the data that should get the most curation, however we define it. Um, what you know, it's it's like there's an estimate on I'm going to put this much money towards data management. NSF supports these things, but there's not a clear understanding of what that truly means. And uh, he he has great concern about this in um, education tools. Uh, just broad understanding that that is a big gap. Um, I, if you all could jump in on that, I would appreciate it um, to, to discuss that further. Who would like to go first? <laughs> Shelly, I just noticed there's also a, I'm I'm going to answer a question in the q and I'm going to oh. join in in just a second. I'm going to answer a question. Okay. I, I do see Doug's question. So I, I'm sorry, Doug, I, I didn't jump on that one next, but I'll let Danny jump on it. So I'll, Danny, I'll let you answer that. Um, Matt, do you want do you want to talk to um, this gap in understanding? You mentioned during your talk education, um, and so did Martin. So um, I think that I think it's worth trying to think through that. I'll take a stab. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure I have the answer. Um, so can I think how to just answer this? So. so yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. So so one of the things that I think about kind of education and, and working with the community and kind of this gap is that we need to be careful in who we, the way we frame things to different stakeholders, um, I think is a really important piece. And I use a brief analogy is that the train company that I use here in Amsterdam does not send me emails about how the train system works and the train signals and all of the nuts and bolts of the trains. But they tell me how I use that very basically. I, I can tap my contact list now and it's very easy for me to do. And I can get to, you know, I can do my daily commute or get to the airport very easy. And so they give me the right amount of information that I realize the benefit. I can see the clear benefit and how to use this. And so I think these are kind of when we address these gaps, this is the same thing that we need to apply. I think we too often get caught up in trying to, because I think the nature of research is that we want to understand everything and the details. And we all involved in that community, but we must be very careful because I think when we get into all the details, we sometimes overburden people in kind of this, this addressing, trying to address this gap, but this is too much information and it's not necessarily all relevant. So I think that's kind of what I will say. I don't necessarily have the on-chain kind of the engagement and working across the community. I think that needs a bit more thought and it's a collective effort. It, it's, um, but yeah, um, that's kind of my thoughts on that. I, I can give you our agency a position on this, which may or may not be helpful. Um, as you as you may or may not remember, um, NSF allows costs to be charged to grants and put in budgets, uh, proposal budgets for data management and sharing purposes. Um, that the specifics of it and whether or not the amounts requested are adequate or too much or that kind of thing are elements of the peer review process for intellectual merit in uh, the peer review of proposals that are typically done by panels of, of uh, informed experts from the community. Uh, so the question of what is reasonable to charge what is reasonable to request all of that is very much something that is an emerging um, topic in, especially in the context of different disciplines it uh, you know one size will not fit all there are different kinds of requirements for data management and sharing in different disciplines and uh, developing more nuance and uh, common understanding of these costs is a, a pretty important challenge for our disciplines these days and especially in the next period uh, as we move into the space where clearly there are more tasks, more nuance in the uh, metadata 
and just data management and sharing uh, activities going on in projects. But also you don't want to spend all your money on managing the data. You want to spend the majority of your uh, awards on gathering the data and processing it and coming to scientific conclusions. Thank you, Martin. That is really that is really spot on. Um, so I, I there are. Um, uh, thank you for answering Doug's question, Danny. Um, so heading back over to um, how what does it mean to prepare data for publication? What does it mean to have it be interoperable? What does it mean? So the hard ones, right? The the interoperability and the reusability. I mean, I I I think that's where. Um, the whole point of linking the data to publication, linking it to your ORCID, linking it to your grant and such, is that the you'll 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 have it for transparency, you'll have it for potential reproducibility. And so what is what does that mean exactly? So so I am challenged with questions that come um uh, authors who ask a question or researchers who walk up to our data help desk that we host, um, you know, what what data do I share and where do I put it? And the one thing that is so hard, these are these are crazy hard questions and you, you would think not, but not all data needs to be curated at the same amount, at the same level, and not all data, uh, uh, Danny's diagram of all of the different places data could go could easily be more complex um, depending on the type of research. And I, I wonder if you could all talk about um, this, this challenge. How do we explain to a researcher, put your data in four different places, and honestly, that's the best way to go. It, it doesn't resolve well. Um, like, it, it doesn't really make sense, except it does. And I think it's that incentive on the other side. Um, Okay, I said enough. So let me hold there. Danny, do you want to jump back in the conversation? Sure. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. And you know, Martin Martin hit on a couple of pieces of this in in his talk about um, yes, it's hard. Where can we leverage AI to release that burden from the from the researcher? Repositories are that glue between accepting the information and making those connections so that it can go on to Matt, it can go on to data site and, and um, trying to release as much of the burden of the researcher as possible. Where can we as repositories leverage AI so that it's doing the hard work for us, but there's still that disciplinary curation person in the loop checking and doing the quality control so that those hallucinations aren't getting promulgated out into the content. And I think there's a space in there. There's a balance between um, between still having that disciplinary curation and the eyes on the information, but leveraging AI that is emerging to be able to streamline this process. I think there are efficiencies to be found in there. I think it still requires people in the loop, but I think we can release the burden from the researcher more. I know so we're running out of time. We've um, got one minute. So do you want to wind I, it up, Martin? I, I, I want to uh, comment that Matt really hit an important, critically important point about incentivization. Who, who are we going to incentivize in this system to manage the quality control, the linkage, all this stuff associated with the um, interlinkages of content and data? Because without incentives, it's not going to happen. Without somebody being charged with the responsibility or under or taking it on, it is simply not going to happen. We have to figure out those issues of incentivization. I I would foot stomp that significantly. Um, I it just happened to yes, we we all need to take that one up. Thank thank you to my our speakers. Uh, Danny Kincaid, Martin Halbert, and Matt Byes. Thank you to Chorus for hosting this and along with the sponsors of Chorus, um, uh, Howard Ratner and Tara Packer. It is, it is always a really good conversation. Um, thank you to everyone who has come and, and participated and hopefully we'll be sharing this information with your colleagues. Um, and I'm really grateful for the discussion. Uh, and hopefully we'll have more uh, work towards incentives and more support for researchers as we make data linked uh, even more robustly.
Yeah, th thanks, Shelly and Matt and Martin and Danny. Uh, great talk. Lots to think about. Uh, obviously, a lot more work to be done here. Um, to all of our attendees, we hope you all found this session interesting and informative. We'll be sharing the video and presentations in a few days. And once again, a huge thank you to all of our panelists and our sponsors, ACS, AIP Publishing, Geoscience World, Silverchair, and STM. Um, enjoy the rest of your week. Take care. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thank Harry. you. Thanks, Shelley.